Um, with that said, welcome to the Pacific Seminar Series with the Australian Centre for Pacific Islands Research. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome. Um, today we have Mike Sackett joining us again, so we're really fortunate to have him back. He did a skills session with us a few months ago now, um, and he's kindly agreed to come back and do a seminar series with us. So Mike has experience, well, 22 years of experience, was that right? Yeah, working for the UN agency, um, the World Food Program, WFP. So today he's going to be sharing us or sharing with us some insight about some of the logistics, operations and management behind the scenes with WFP, as well as a bit of a spotlight on the work they do in the Pacific region. Yeah, great. Um, so with that said, if you'd like to chat with Mike, if you've got any questions throughout the session, please pop your hand up or just, you know, speak out loud. Mike's happy for this to be a more interactive conversation with everyone. Um, and of course, you can also put your questions in the chat and we'll, you know, we'll come back to them if we miss them. Uh, so with that said, I will hand you over to Mike and then I'll let him take it away. So thank you, Mike. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Amy. Um, it's interesting, World Food Program is, uh, in the last 24 hours, I've heard two references on the ABC. Uh, yesterday, um, Penny Wong announced that Australian government was making a, a $2 million contribution for flood relief in Pakistan. Uh, and this morning, there was an interview with the WFP's regional director in East Africa, who was receiving a shipment of wheat from Ukraine that was then heading up into uh, uh, the Tigray uh, region of Ethiopia. So um, very current uh, and so on. Um, what we're going to do now is, is run through um, the key aspects of World Food Programme. Let me just say um, my background with them. I joined WFP as the deputy country director in uh, Bangladesh in uh, 1979. I then moved and had a, a spell in uh, WFP headquarters uh, with uh, what was then called the Project Programming Branch. Um, I then uh, had five years as country director in Kenya. Uh, I moved to Afghanistan as a country director in uh, the then Taliban time. Um, and after that, I moved to uh, um, Johannesburg, where I was regional director covering the southern 10 southern African uh, countries. So um, World Food Programme is one of just about well, over 40 UN agencies. Um, it was established as long ago as 1963. It has its headquarters in Rome, along with two other food agencies. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And there's a good amount of interaction and collaboration between those three food-related agencies. Um, it's the food aid arm of the UN, so obviously deals with food, but it has very strong um, expertise in both logistics and telecommunications. Uh, it, we will focus on the scale of the, um, the organization and its, uh, its work. It describes itself as the world's largest humanitarian uh, organization. Uh, and in 2020 was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its work. It's not moving along this time, I'm not sure why. There we go. So I mentioned the scale, um, and here are some numbers which I think are, are rather impressive. So last year, from its annual report, WFP assisted 128 million people around the world in over 80 countries, nearly 10 million refugees, two and a half million uh, refugees who were assisted returning to their home country, and uh, almost 19 million 
internally displaced people. So people who very often due to conflict uh, were moved away from their home areas and uh, received WFP food uh, to, to help them in that process. There's a particular focus on children. Uh, under five children comprise more than 20% of the uh, recipients of WFP food. And then a further 36% are older kids between five and 17. And just a couple of words on governance. It's governed by an executive board uh, comprising 36 uh, countries, 36 members of the UN, 12 of which are so-called economically developed and 24 are developing countries. Uh, and interestingly, Australia is currently uh, a member of the executive board uh, for a three-year term, which ends at the end of this year. Uh, the CEO of uh, WFP uh, is a, uh, an American appointee, the former governor of South Carolina, who is currently in the sixth year of his term. We're having just a few stickiness issues. Thank you. Um, thanks. The, so a number of strategic objectives of WFP, ending hunger by protecting access to food, improving nutrition, uh, achieving food security, uh, supporting the sustainable development goals of the UN, and working with partners uh, to achieve that. And uh, WFP is a, a significant uh, contributor to um, the second strategic development goal, which is uh, achieving zero hunger by 2030. Um, I'm not sure what the prospects of that uh, actually being achieved, but clearly WFP is attempting to move in that direction. So what are the main activities of WFP? Uh, first of all, it provides assistance in both the form of food and cash to the poorest people. Um, these are, it, it, we refer to um, food insecure people um, and they live in the least developed countries. Food insecure people are basically people who through lack of income or lack of uh, access to food uh, are very uncertain about where their next meal or tomorrow's meal is uh, coming from. It's not a concept that is very familiar in this country, but in many developing countries, it's a reality. Um, the By far the largest part of WFP's work is in crisis response, more than 80%, in fact. Uh, and again, the numbers are quite staggering. WFP's total assistance last year was something over eight and a half billion US dollars. So biggest chunk of work is uh, crisis response. Uh, secondly, resilience building, just over 10% of their resources going to that. And if you think in the Pacific context, that means working with the disaster management organizations of Fiji, Tonga, um, et cetera, and, and helping them strengthen their capacity to respond to uh, emergencies, uh, the primary result of which is almost universally um, a lack of food, a shortage of food, and general food insecurity. Um, there's a small um, amount of uh, development work that WFP does. When it started out in the 1960s, it was primarily a development agency. That side of its work has reduced and the um, crisis response, emergency response has increased very, very markedly. Um, what are the key principles of WFP's food assistance. Firstly, um, it is targeted to specific beneficiaries. Um, it's based on the assessment of needs. So a lot of painstaking work goes to assessing needs, figuring out 
who needs food, for how long, in which location. Um, and it's very important that uh, that work is done to avoid one food being wasted and even worse, food, act, uh, food aid acting uh, counterproductively. Uh, it, and when I say counterproductive, think about the uh, season specificity. If you bring a lot of food in, um, in the post-harvest period, that depresses market prices. That's bad news for farmers. So the uh, WFP will try to bring food in the agricultural lean season pre-harvest. And the fifth main um, principle of WFP assistance is that it is able to be monitored so that uh, WFP can keep a handle on who is getting it. I always used to say everybody wants and likes free food, but not everybody is uh, entitled to it. So that's, that's the um, focus of, of monitoring. I'm going to talk a, a little bit uh, here about the, um, uh, to, to give an understanding of, of why WFP's work is important. If you look at child nutrition, um, the, and, and UNICEF puts out some very good data on this, it, it has, uh, for all countries, estimates of the percentage of under five children who are stunted uh, and wasted. And there are very particular uh, definitions of these. And, and it's interesting that differences in children's growth in the first five years are, are most influenced by nutrition and feeding practices uh, rather than uh, genetics or ethnicity. So it's quite a robust measure of comparison uh, from country to country. So what is stunting? Uh, essentially, uh, stunted kids under the age of five are those who are below height for age. Um, and that's an indicator of chronic malnutrition. Those kids have never have enough to eat, so they, they are below the standard height for age. And the other indicase, uh, indicator is wasted kids under the age of five, and they have a, uh, their weight is below the standard for the height, um, or in, in colloquial terms, they are um, extremely thin, and that's an indicator of episodic malnutrition. In other words, they've, they've been going along quite well, growing well, and then there's a bad crop, a drought or something, and then for a period of uh, weeks or months, they have not had sufficient food and they are wasted. Let's look at some uh, general indicators around the world. So I've taken the average for Sub-Saharan and South Asia. And it's interesting, in both those uh, underprivileged areas, roughly one third of kids are stunted. Um, in terms of wasting, uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa situation is slightly less bad than in South Asia. 6% uh, in South, uh, SSA, 15% in South Asia. Now look at the figures for those Pacific Island countries, especially PNG, Solomons, and Vanuatu. PNG is especially egregious. 48% of kids in PNG are stunted. They're below standard uh, height uh, for, for weight. Um, and the, also the, the wasting figure is, is pretty grim as well. So, I mean, stunting is much worse than either Sub-Saharan Africa average or South Asia average, and um, wasting is, is roughly the same. Uh, things are almost as bad in Solomons and uh, Vanuatu, much less bad in Fiji and Tonga, but still, um, even in uh, Fiji, Tonga, uh, to have three to 7% of kids stunted is, uh, is unacceptable. And uh, in most developed countries, the, the stunting rate is a fraction of 1%. So um, we have a problem uh, globally, 
and that problem also uh, extends to uh, uh, the, the Pacific. I'm going to say a little bit about uh, how WFP uh, gets its resources. Um, it, it's interesting, I, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the uh, shipment arriving in uh, uh, Djibouti for Ethiopia uh, yesterday. And the, the BBC report spoke of, um, it was very timely that this was arriving because um, WFP's reserves were running uh, low. WFP has no reserves. It simply operates on a hand-to-mouth basis. It gets its resources principally from governments around the world. Some it is provided by uh, private sector, but it's, it's only one or two percent of the total. So in terms of where does WFP get its resources from, it's governments, and we'll have a look at who the main uh, donors are shortly. Um, donors give to WFP principally in the form of cash, um, or they may provide uh, food commodities with the cash, which enables the food to be delivered to beneficiaries. Um, WFP, when it receives cash resources from donors, these are used to buy food commodities. Um, that's one modality. Secondly, they can be used for uh, cash transfers. That's a relatively uh, new modality over the last decade. Um, cash is also required to pay for food transport to beneficiaries, and that's of, uh, often a very expensive process. Um, typically, uh, beneficiaries live in remote areas, poor road communications, expensive to get bulky food to them. But uh, food is no good sitting in a port. It has to be um, available in people's uh, villages. The, on the screen now, are the, the last year, the major donors to WFP, US is almost always, in fact, I can say always the largest donor. Uh, last year, it provided uh, three, close to $4 billion out of the uh, 8.6 billion that uh, WFP spent. So around almost 40% of the total. Second largest with uh, some European, uh, Germany, the European Commission, uh, and the UK. Uh, Canada then comes in uh, at number five with about 3% of the total. Australia um, doesn't have the greatest uh, track record. Um, we're the 13th largest economy in the world. And for um, it, it has been in the top 10, but certainly over the last uh, five to eight years has fallen back. Um, there was quite a considerable increase in 2021 uh, versus 2020, uh, but it still puts uh, Australia um, supplying only just over 1% of the total uh, budget of World Food Programme and puts it in 14th place. Who were the major recipients last year of WFP assistance? Um, the list is there. Um, Yemen, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Syria, Sudan, and Afghanistan. And the common factor through those six countries essentially is conflict, uh, very often exacerbated by drought or floods, but the, the bottom line is they're affected by conflict and that's made people additionally food insecure. I've put in there at the bottom the WFP's assistance. Um, it is minute in the overall scheme of things, four and a half million dollars. Uh, WFP only opened its office in, uh, in Suva in 2016, uh, and I think is committed to uh, addressing food insecurity in the Pacific. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, what types of food uh, does WFP provide? I mean, essentially, I've already said this, the, the, 
the biggest challenge WFP faces is that needs far exceed available uh, resources. And it's apparent that gap, that gap is growing. Um, WFP is absolutely forced to look for the most cost-effective uh, sources of energy and protein, uh, and also in any particular context, will decide whether to provide uh, food or cash to beneficiaries. The, there are three main groups of uh, food products that WFP uh, provides. The first is cereals. Um, that's essentially the main energy source. Uh, the cereal provided is tailored to the particular part of the world, not surprisingly, therefore, uh, in Asia, West Africa, and probably the Pacific, rice would be the main uh, cereal provided. In uh, Asia, Middle East, in West Asia and the Middle East, it's wheat. And in Eastern and Southern Africa, the cereal of choice is maize. The, just a mention of another important energy source in a post-disaster situation. Um, if you have a cyclone or an earthquake, wipes out uh, domestic cooking facilities. It's not much good uh, providing a food product that needs a lot of preparation. So in the immediate aftermath of an emergency, uh, WFP will try to supply high energy biscuits something that people can eat straight away without any preparation. Uh, but that only happens for a relatively short period of time because the, the unit cost of uh, the calories is 15 to 20 times that of the basic cereals. The protein source, um, forget animal protein, uh, fish and meat, uh, Protein source is principally legumes, peas, beans, pulses. Um, and that's, again, for reasons of cost effectiveness. Um, we'll move then to the third uh, food category, vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are a, a dense form of um, calories, um, which is helpful, especially for children. Um, and they, uh, vegetable oils in the uh, mix include or improves the palatability of cereals. So they're the three main food products that WFP uh, provides, uh, energy, protein, and uh, veg oils. Uh, and, but it does pay attention to micronutrients such as iodine and vitamin A. And uh, wherever possible, uh, where, for example, in refugee situations, salt is provided, it will be iodine enriched salt. Um, very often in uh, both cereals and flour, that's enriched with vitamin A for, for obvious nutritional reasons. Uh, another important uh, type of food product that WFP distributes, especially aimed at, at uh, children, are um, micronutrient-enriched uh, cereal, soya-based blended foods. And uh, these uh, originally would have been supplied from uh, developed countries. But one of the things that I think WFP has done a good job is um, stimulating and encouraging the production of these uh, high, um, highly nutritious foods uh, having them produced in developing countries, um, which works well. Um, WP gets cash. What does it do with the cash? Um, it certainly uh, seeks to uh, procure food, to buy food. Um, the, the cash then purchase the food, transport the food, distribute the food, and food purchases are made on a competitive basis. Um, where feasible, WFP procures food as close as possible to where the beneficiaries are. And that clearly has advantages both to WFP and to the beneficiaries. For WFP, it can and should reduce the cost of uh, transport and storage. Um, sometimes, but not always, 
the local cost of food is less than um, that from more distant uh, origins. And it certainly can save time. When you're living on a hand-to-mouth basis without stocks to rely on, you, you simply need to get food in days, not weeks or months. Um, and to the beneficiaries, uh, it is an advantage uh, having food purchased relatively locally because it will be in a form more familiar to them. Uh, in addition, the, there are uh, benefits uh, from procuring locally. It, it supports local markets um, and, and does so to quite a significant degree. So last year, uh, WFP uh, purchased close to $2 billion worth of uh, food from uh, both developed and developing countries, but that did include uh, uh, almost 80 developing countries with sources of purchased food, and, and the vast majority of food did come from developing countries. Uh, the, the largest origin was Turkey, uh, and you can see there that something like $350 million worth of food was bought in Turkey last year. Um, I think the biggest volume of food WFP bought, and that was something like three quarters of a million tons, was in Ukraine. And that's why um, the, the Russian invasion there has been so significant and so negative for, well, amongst other people, World Food Programme. It, it simply has always been a very major source of principally wheat, uh, which is used in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, Cash-based transfers. If, if I'd given this lecture 15 years ago, I wouldn't have mentioned them. But since 2009, WFP has had a policy to distribute its assistance in the most appropriate form, um, including cash or vouchers, which can be exchanged for food. Um, the absolute precondition of uh, cash-based transfers is that it's in uh, situations where there is a reasonably well-developed, well-supplied market. Uh, the worst thing you could do is to inject a lot of cash in a situation like South Sudan, where markets are very rudimentary, very poorly supplied. If you supplied cash to beneficiaries in those situations, it would simply push the price of food the meager amount of food available through the roof. So um, WFP adopts a, a horses for courses approach where appropriate cash or vouchers to exchange for food. Um, in other situations, it distributes food. And this is a, a significantly growing area, uh, currently about one quarter of WFPs assistance is in the uh, uh, through cash. What are the advantages of cash? Um, Cash-based transfers certainly help to empower recipients. They can use that cash to buy the food or other items of their choice. Uh, WFP finds that if you put the cash in the hands of women, uh, the very large proportion of that tends to be spent on food. Um, again, WFP monitors what happens to the use of that cash, and the general uh, experience and findings are quite positive that uh, cash to very poor people is primarily spent on enhancing their food supplies. Um, another very significant advantage uh, of using cash, I can't think of any countries that have particularly well-developed uh, food assistance programs, but many developing countries do have uh, social protection programs uh, based on cash transfers. So it, it um, meshes much better with, um, with government programs if you distribute cash. And it, it can also be a, a, a very useful promoter of well-functioning markets um, in developing countries. 
the it uh, cash based transfers in in many situations are more efficient they save costs um they certainly can be beneficial for the recipients um wfp when it distributes food tends to do this uh on in a, a monthly distribution and if you see um little old ladies struggling home with a 40 kilos of um, wheat flour or maize, um, you understand what you mean by reducing recipient transaction costs through cash. So, and it can also uh, have a, a timeliness factor. The, I mean, just a, a passing observation, WFP's adoption of uh, cash transfers certainly presented a significant organizational risk for them a decade ago. Um, they had expertise in uh, shipping and trucking and dealing, uh, uh, et cetera. And then they had to transfer this to dealing with uh, retailers, banks, um, and even in East Africa, a lot of really quite sophisticated uh, number of these transfers are done through mobile phones surprisingly enough. Um, but that transition has taken place over the last decade and seems to have been remarkably hit the wrong button, uh, successful. Can we, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the experience to date is, it's been rapidly increasing. It seems to be well received. Uh, and it, the, the particular area where it's been most successful have been with the, the countries that uh, Syrian refugees have gone to. So the surrounding Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, which have rel relatively uh, well-developed markets and um, cash distributions have worked very well there. Um, they just now, um, looking at uh, WFP in the Pacific. So WFP is not by any means a major or significant player in the Pacific. It uh, only opened its office in Suva uh, six years ago, but at present it covers uh, 13 countries and territories around the Pacific um, from, uh, I guess, PNG in the West to, uh, Tonga in the in the east. Its particular focus uh, really or well, threefold focus. Um, the it is uh, attempting to uh, strengthen and support the national disaster management offices in Pacific territories countries, um, specifically through uh, emergency logistics. Um, supply chain management. A lot of effort goes into emergency communications, which might strike you as surprising for a, a food aid agency, but WFP has, has really had to uh, establish such capacity through necessity um, to, to get the food through to where it's required. Um, and the, the, there is also the uh, the, the ever increasing threat of uh, climate related uh, disasters. WFP is helping the disaster management agencies in the Pacific to address and respond as quickly as possible uh, to natural disasters. So in five countries, uh, WFP is uh, has established what they call their mobile vulnerability assessment, sorry, a, a vulnerability analysis and mapping platform. And there they remotely gather data uh, from those five countries and from the rural areas well, and the urban centers of those countries um, to, to uh, look to, to achieve a time series of indicators so that there, there is a better understanding of the food sec uh, security situation in those countries. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, to date, um, no such data collection uh, is, uh, takes place for 
the Solomons and PNG, which as I've already indicated are from a child nutrition point of view, by far the, the most effective. Um, but uh, I think WFP is receptive to extending this work to Solomons and PNG. It's certainly needed. And it may be a case of uh, them working with donors to get the funding to then set up the uh, system. So that's really uh, World Food Program in whatever it is, uh, 35 minutes. Um, I'd, I'd be very happy to uh, um, answer any questions. I, I hope I haven't uh, confounded you. I wasn't interrupted at all. And I, I was hoping to be interrupted. But anyway, over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, does anyone have any questions in the room or anyone online? Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, well, actually, Mike, I probably actually should have interrupted you when you were talking because I was thinking about it at the time and then I think I was just listening and I kept going. But you were mentioning earlier around stunting and wasting sort of being this indication that potentially we, there's food insecurity issues and, and a need for WFP in those particular regions. And I can understand historically that that would be quite important and, and definitely still, but I wondered if uh, overweight um, indicators was something that maybe they're also looking towards nowadays since the prevalence of overweight has been increasing and is often uh, in my eyes an indicator of food security as well mm. yeah no that's that is a good uh, a good question um so my data on the stunting and wasting uh comes from unicef state of the world's children uh, it's one of the statistical annexes to that report, and it, it's always the table I look at first. But um, in, I don't know, a couple of columns further to the right, after the stunting and wasting, there, there are uh, obesity data for sure. Um, the, I don't, I mean, the, from recollection in PNG Solomons, I don't think there is any uh, observable um, obesity, but further east in the Pacific, in uh, uh, Tonga, Samoa, um, certainly the, there are relatively uh, significant figures there. Um, you, I think um, I, the way I'd put it is sort of in the hierarchy of needs and issues to be addressed, I would look at, at child stunting and wasting um, to me, the obesity issue is much more one of educating people away from, you know, sugary biscuits and, and uh, soft drinks, et cetera. But um, it, anyway, my and I think WFP's focus is primarily stunting and wasting, but obesity can be a problem. Yes. Yeah. And thank you. And it, it makes sense with the stunting and the wasting, but I guess I wonder if maybe moving into the future, we will start to see more of a focus towards some of the issues around overweight and obesity in some of those um, countries that you mentioned. But um, yeah, great. Thank you, Mike. Does anyone else have a question um, in the room? Yes, Amy, I'll come over to you. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, that uh, a lot of their interventions sort of run across the supply chain. So what's the level of representation of people and workers from across the supply chain in WFP um, so that they can ensure that those sorts of interventions are, are appropriate? The, okay, well, let me address this by uh, talking about how WFP actually delivers its assistance. I mean, first of all, um, where there is a functioning government, WFP operates through that uh, functioning government. Uh, I've already mentioned the disaster management agencies. On the development side, they would work through uh, the Ministry of Education, food going into schools and uh, food going into clinics and hospitals through the local ministries of health. So first of all, there's a very strong um, link with governments. Not all uh, country situations 
have um, functioning governments. If you think of uh, countries like uh, South Sudan, Somalia, the, uh, uh, the government apparatus is, is pretty rudimentary. Um, so in such situations, uh, WFP will get more involved, um, but NGOs are particularly important there. So these can be international NGOs, Save the Children, uh, World Vision, et cetera, or local NGOs, where, which tend to have very strong uh, links with the community. So um, they are sort of ways in which the, uh, if you like, the local actors can be involved. Um, the, also, I mentioned and, and I hope gave quite a lot of attention to the, uh, the monitoring which WFP does. Uh, so that really uh, entails uh, opening a dialogue with beneficiaries, uh, getting feedback from them, and I mean, one of the results of that was uh, that wherever possible, WFP will try to distribute food through women. Uh, food typically is women's business. And that, that sort of interaction reflects intelligence that has been picked up over the years by working and interacting with, with beneficiaries. It, is that helpful? Absolutely. I think also just... To add to that question, um, as a, an organisation, is does the um, disciplines or the skills that the WFP sort of recruits and employs, does that sort of reflect um, people with experience in working in the food supply chain? And yeah, and what does that look like? I guess the I'd answer that in in um, uh, it, there's the World Food Programme generalist, um, and I've seen uh, very successful nutritionists. I mean, that, they're not generalists, but um, uh, so it can be uh, nutrition. Uh, you, you can have um, uh, people with law degrees. Uh, there's a whole variety of people go into the general management side, but I'd say the logisticians are primarily uh, people with experience in that industry, very often from the private sector. And the, I mean, a, a typical, let me give you an example. Um, when I was in uh, Kenya, we had on the uh, east of Kenya, a refugee camp with 110,000 refugees from Somalia in a very flat area that was prone to flooding. So the, the objective was uh, to establish a working stock of food uh, sufficient for three months. It, it's a, a well-defined rainy season. So the general assumption was, let's get three months food stock in there, start of the rainy season to see us through. In the, the late 90s, there was a very severe um, La Nina rain event, and that refugee uh, camp was cut off for five months. Um, so we basically sat down with the logisticians and said, well, what are we going to do? You know, we can't have 100,000 refugees starved to death. Um, what was done was to set up a air delivery uh, system. The distance was minimal, but it was flying over uh, flooded areas, dropping the food uh, to uh, the refugee camp. Um, and just it was a brilliant logistics uh, exercise carried out by you know, logistic professionals who knew what they were doing. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Sarah? Um, thank you, Mike, so much for your overview. And I think I'm just reflecting, it's a shame that more of our students are not here um, with us. Because I think what I took away from that presentation was balancing the tensions between lots of the decisions that get made um, and I think, you know, a lot of us come from particular disciplines where we might just have that lens um, and see that as being, I guess, maybe all encompassing or most important. But I'm thinking from a student perspective too, what are the kind of attributes that would serve you well in working in this kind of environment if students are thinking about that? Um, oh, sense of adventure. Um, 
uh, a willingness to tackle problems, not um, to think laterally, as it were. Um, it, I would say um, the UN is not highly regarded for its um, um, thinking outside the box, but somehow over the years, WFP has managed to get people who, who do that. It, it has a culture of that. Um, I guess it's partly a culture of, of risk taking. Sometimes that risk taking goes badly astray, uh, et cetera. But um, when lives are at stake, it, it is a balance of those, um, those factors. And um, the key really is um, really good managers who um, are equipped to uh, balance those risks. And very often with, I found great support from um, surprisingly enlightened senior people in WFP headquarters. It, it was uh, quite a remarkable uh, environment, in fact. Sorry, Sarah. No. I was just going I can say, I can imagine that, Mike, too. And um, thank you. I think that's really nice to hear. Um, and I think students who are with us now or who might revisit this afterwards, um, that's good advice, too, I think, thinking outside of just the, the content maybe and what are some of the other skills that you might need to bring yeah thank you thanks Sarah I, there are some questions in the chat I will actually ask you one more before we get to them because I think it's related to what Sarah was just saying in the last time we met with you we had some good discussions around what sort of prerequisites we could call them that someone may need if they were interested in this sort of line of career that you've gone down and I wondered if you had, because we do have a couple of nutrition students here today and online. So I wondered if you had some advice or sort of tips around what sort of steps you need to follow um, this to have this career pathway, I suppose. The, well, certainly um, WFP needs um, a whole variety of skills. If someone was particularly interested, they should get in touch with WFP in Suva. Um, when I um, in, embarked on the uh, preparation for this lecture, I was specifically asked if I came across really bright, um, enthusiastic students that they were interested. So it's a, it's a two-way process. Students obviously would like to have a, an interesting and rewarding working experience. WFP needs really good people uh, to help it do its work. So um, I would suggest that such people would would um, uh, fire off their um, resumes to WFP in Suva. I, I can give you a, a contact that you can circulate afterwards. Um, no guarantees, no nothing. But if you, your name and your details are not with them, then you don't have a chance. But uh, I think it is that is the way to go forward. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And actually, I really appreciate that. That would be great to get those contact details afterwards. I think you've touched on a really good note because it's something I often say to students in, in my lectures is to just reach out to these different organisations and make that connection. Um, and maybe it doesn't lead to anything, but at least you've sort of your name's out there and you can work towards that in the future. Um, I guess maybe I did wasn't too clear with my question, but I wondered if there was any particular sorts of you know do you need a HDR you know a high degree by research in order to work for any of these organizations or is it you know experience in non-government organizations or um, the any particular experiences that are essential certainly if, if, if you're looking at a, a WFP career um, really a master's degree in in really any um, relevant discipline and that's a pretty wide definition is what is required um, I, I can think of uh, historically uh, extremely successful WFP managers who did not even have a first degree. Now, that may be somewhat different today. Um, but I think for, for people uh, perhaps who want to, to start to be involved, there are consultancy opportunities um, for in, in uh, the needs assessment area where I would think nutrition or health skills would be uh, quite appropriate. Um, it, I don't think a master's degree is absolutely mandatory there, but experience certainly is. And I always say that the 
um, a very good way to get experience is by working with NGOs, particularly the, the more professional international NGOs. They always need um, field level workers, and that's a really great uh, way in which to get experience. Yeah, and thank you for clarifying that, Mike. And it's good to hear that because I think some of the experiences that we have in these different environments, I mean, it speaks a million words, right, for how we can apply ourselves in these different work experiences, as opposed to sometimes having, you know, the credentials and so forth. But yeah, okay, great. Uh, there's a question on the other side of the room. Yes, I'm going to head over there. And there's one on the chat. So I will come back to that one. There's two on the chat. Okay, that's good. We're having a good discussion. Uh, thanks, Mike. It was really good uh, uh, presentation. So my question is about uh, monitoring uh, phase of the of the work. There are is that like uh, this program includes refugees who are registered by United Nation or or others who are not registered. And yeah. what's the what's the plan for the for the guys who are not registered? Because the reason I'm asking, I've seen lots of refugees, especially in our country, coming from Afghanistan or Iraq after their war, and it's over probably two or three million people. And uh, I'm fairly sure that most of them are not registered and how this uh, support could get to those people who need it. Uh, yeah. The uh, World Food Programme has a, a, uh, a very well established uh, relationship with the UN High Commission for Refugees. They, there is a, a, if you like, an established division of labor between what WFP is responsible for in a refugee situation and what UNHCR is responsible for. So WFP essentially is responsible for getting the, the various food products that I mentioned, um, procuring them, transporting them to the refugee camp uh, and, may, and then uh, paying for usually an NGO to distribute that to uh, identified refugees. Uh, on the other hand, UNHCR in a refugee camp situation, they're responsible for uh, shelter, water and sanitation, um, clothing, education, protection, um, even mundane things like the provision of soap. So um, this is a very long standing. Uh, relationship between the two organizations and um, well it, it, the the Afghan refugees that you refer to in my time in Afghanistan I think there were something like four million Afghan refugees principally in Pakistan uh, also a large number in Iran um, and uh, yes yeah, so that's how WFP comes in and assists refugees and if you remember the numbers at the beginning, I think last year WFP assisted almost 10 million refugees uh, working with UNHCR out of the 128 million people it assisted. So uh, quite a significant uh, chunk of assistance. Did, does that answer your question? Right, we might have a look at the chat. Sorry, I thought there was a question there. <laughs> I can see the chat questions here too. Yeah. Everyone's got the chat questions. Okay. A couple of co comments in here. One from Lee. These are great questions. It's been such a fascinating overview. Thank you. What would you say have been some of the highlights of the roles you've undertaken? <laughs> um, <laughs> you can summarize I, that for us. The uh, I, I, one that I really remember and, and, uh, it's both amusing, but also insightful. Uh, when I was working in Southern Africa, based in Johannesburg, one of our donors was the OPEC Fund. So the Organization of Petroleum Exp Exporting Countries um, used to give uh, money to World Food Program. They weren't a major donor, but it, it was, I don't know, four or five million dollars um, out of the 200 million that we dealt with. Anyway, the OPEC fund uh, announced that they wanted to uh, 
come and visit us and see how we had used uh, the, the funding that they had given World Food Programme. And uh, so we took them to uh, Zambia and to Zimbabwe. And uh, I tagged along on this mission. Um, when we got to Zimbabwe, um, the then president was a certain uh, Robert Mugabe, who pricked up his ears when he heard the OPEC fund were in town, asked for a meeting with them. And um, so the meeting took place. Uh, Mr. Mugabe was on one side, the OPEC fund on the other. Um, and there was a lot of mutual admiration going on between the two sides. And then Mr. Mugabe turned to me and said, uh, and what has the World Food Programme got to say for themselves? And I said, well, sir, I'd just like to remind you that food aid is distributed on the basis of need, not uh, political affiliation. And I think Robert Mugabe was not used to uh, being addressed so, uh, so bluntly. But the, I mean, the, the background to this was um, uh, in the, this was the, I don't know, 2004 or something, uh, there had been uh, instances where the local ZANU PF Mugabe party, um, probably in the, around the time of an election, uh, had uh, tried to stop WFP food going to uh, particular areas where the opposition was strong. And anyway, WFP in Zimbabwe had a mantra, and it's the one I just mentioned, that food is distributed on the basis of need, not political affiliation. And where there were cases of abuse, we found the best way to get the message through was we simply turned off the flow of food if uh, it was being abused. And that very quickly uh, got the message through that food was, WP food was distributed on the basis of need, not political ZANU PF affiliation. So an amusing, but I think insightful anecdote, perhaps. Yeah, certainly an insightful one, Mike, and thank you for sharing. I can imagine that would have felt quite satisfying when you, you know, provided that comment. Well, I still tell the tale uh, <laughs> several years later. Yeah. It's still satisfying years on. All right, great. Lee said thank you. Perfect. Let's have a look because I know there was another question in here. Um, so we've got one from Anali. With the current climate change impact on islands within the Pacifica region, does the WFP have an association with regards research into agriculture or aquaculture spheres that teaches the Pacifica people to grow foods in minimal land spaces or in an aqueous environment? Okay, no, that's that's a great question. Um, I mean, certainly climate change is is on the radar of WFP in the Pacific, but in, in terms of agricultural research, that is not WFP's area. WFP, uh, sorry, the, the UN system uh, has a division of labor where, uh, for example, agricultural research is primarily the responsibility of the food and agriculture organization. So um, I one of the things that, that I'm currently doing, I'm acting as a mentor for newly appointed WFP country directors. And, and I'm currently doing this in um, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uganda, uh, and Mali and Guinea in West Africa. And, and one of the key bits of advice I try to impart to these newly appointed country directors is that uh, try to establish um, meaningful relationships with the um, uh, brother or sister UN agencies. And, and that would be, a, I mean, WFP can't do everything. Um, there are structures in the UN for agricultural research and that that's, WFP can point to the, the food insecurity that is caused by ri rising sea levels or more frequent and more intense cyclones. And, and can help to flag the need for such research, but it doesn't have to do everything uh, and, and clearly wouldn't succeed if it tried to. 
Yeah, thank you, Mike. I think that was good to clarify that because we we do have the Food and Agriculture Organisation that's quite involved in, in that area of work. But good to know that they're not just working separately. We can have these connections and interactions between the both to, you know, uh, imply what needs, you know, help each other out, I suppose, in really simple terms. Great. Um, all right, another thank you there in the chat from Anali. So I think she's happy with that. Were there any other questions in the room here? I've been looking at the computer screen. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we'll share the slides afterwards. Great. And the contact details that you share. Yep. <laughs> and if you don't get them, remind me. Yes, all right. I will. Trust me. <laughs> Oh, I didn't even look at the time. It's almost five past one. All right, one more question then, Amy, and then we might finish up and let Mike have a break. Um, I guess I hope this is a quick one anyway, but just from your perspective, um, what do you think some of the primary determinants for, for stu like stunting, particularly in PA PNG, might be? Oh, yeah. Um, it, I'm glad you asked that question because I meant to say it at the time. Um, I, I did a consultancy mission to PNG in 2015. Uh, and it was in the aftermath of um, a then El Nino drought. Um, and, you know, I came across these really quite horrifying child stunting figures. So I, I spoke to a nutritionists. I mean, it seemed to be an anomaly that um, the PNG has fantastic soils. Uh, generally has an abundance of rainfall, although El Nino can interrupt that. But clearly there was this indicator of nu nutritional distress. And the, um, the, the most rational uh, response I got was that the, the staple food in um, PNG typically is sweet potato. It's a very bulky um, root crop. And kids under five find it difficult to assimilate their energy needs um, on an almost exclusively sweet potato diet in rural areas. Um, and, and therefore, they're not uh, consuming enough of the nutrients they need due to the, the physical constraints of their gut system. Um, so, I mean, the... The answer is clearly you, you need a more diverse diet and you need a more uh, primarily energy rich diet through um, well, veg oils and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think it's a combination of uh, um, an education campaign needed uh, and looking at um, you know, the, the poverty effects of, uh, of that uh, situation. Great, thanks Mike. Um, we might finish it there. Um, thank you so much for such an informative presentation. It's always great talking with you, Mike, um, and having you here and sharing your insight. I'm sure everyone online and here in person can agree that is really interesting and, and helpful. So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everybody online. Um, and we'll see you again next time. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>